Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. How's everyone doing? All right. So, as uh, Ben said, I'm Scott Cochran. I'm the director for Madison Youth and Family Services. I have to say it's, a, it, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. It's great to see a, uh, such a big turnout. Uh, maybe a little bit intimidating, uh, but, but that's okay. We'll, we'll deal with that. Uh, if you're not familiar as much with Madison Youth and Family Services, we are a town department. Uh, out of Madison Youth and Family, we provide counseling services, uh, a full array of prevention and youth development services. We have uh, a subdivision that we just recently created known as Community Support. Under that heading, we provide social services, as well as uh, our drug and alcohol coalition known as Made in Madison. Catherine is the head of MAGE. So we're going to be talking about vaping, uh, e-cigarettes. We're going to have information, actually a lot of information, that's directly about uh, the e-cigarettes themselves. So you're going to see what they look like. You're going to um, know what they are, what they do. The other piece that you're going to learn a lot about and, and learn um, uh, initially is some of the, uh, some of the background, the history uh, that developed towards e-cigarettes. We are going to talk about tobacco. That's incredibly important because to understand the behavior of the industries that are creating and marketing the e-cigarettes, all of that was born out of the tobacco industry. So everything that they were doing for hundreds of years, uh, well, yes, essentially for hundreds of years, um, you're going to see pieces of that uh, with e-cigarettes. So we'll go to the next slide. I did not want to forget to thank uh, the people that were involved putting this together. So thanks to the Madison Public Schools. We collaborate a lot with Madison Public Schools. Um, and we are constantly, in, in whether it's at the, at the administrative level, uh, through our programmatic levels, we're constantly in talking with people that are involved with the schools, whether that's uh, people who work with the schools or the students themselves. And a lot of our programs, they, um, they involve the students very directly, and it's the students a lot of the times that are guiding what we do in programs. Uh, so thank you to the PRC, the Polson PTO, and of course our, our host, Polson. So the scope of the problem. To understand this, think about the California wildfires. That was a destructive force that met an area that was very vulnerable and susceptible to the destruction of a wildfire. This was and is still a wildfire. So in terms of the numbers, are, are people familiar last fall when the FDA came out with that big report? Um, it was on the news and you saw a lot on the morning shows. So they were talking about, uh, based on those studies, uh, a, a huge increase um, in terms of e-cigarette use among high school students as well as middle school students. So within a year, 78% among high school, school students and 48% among middle school students. And that's, that's a nationwide statistic. Um, up 1.5 million uh, in just one year. In terms of more lo local data, we were certainly hearing reports anecdotally from students. We were hearing it from schools. Uh, it was one of our high school survey questions, so to be able to report that statistic, from 2017, there was a 29.3% 29, 29.3% reported they had vaped in the last 30 days. So this survey was taken November of 2017. That was a dramatic increase from the last survey, which was two years prior. What's notable is that uh, within that time, vaping became the second uh, most frequent, uh, or most, second most used substance <laughs> just behind alcohol. So where it was historically alcohol, marijuana, and, and other substances, vaping had, had shot up um, between alcohol and marijuana. Make sense? Mm -hmm. All right, let's go. So what happened? Um, well, again, this was a wildfire. Uh, you had a, a bunch of things that kind of converged at the same time. Uh, the tobacco industry was working for many, many years, and we'll talk more about that, around uh, developing uh, a cleaner cigarette. So you had this, at, um, you had going into the 2000s and over the last few years, uh, huge um, uh, leaps in terms of that technology and the ability to make uh, an electronic cigarette that was um, that could be used more efficiently and, and in a way that the public really would would buy in. At the same time, we were thinking that we had tobacco beat. The usage rates were so low, we were so not concerned. Kids were saying cigarettes are bad for you; they stink, they smell, they're awful. 
Um, we weren't too worried about that. And at the same time, we were worried about the other substances, alcohol use, marijuana use, and of course we had the opioid crisis. So we had a lot of attention going to those areas, and we weren't really paying attention. I'm talking sort of culturally, and I think nationally, we weren't paying attention too much to cigarettes. They were a problem in certain areas, but, but across the board, we weren't that worried anymore. We thought we had it beat. Along comes a, a company like Juul, where they had a very precise and effective and brilliant marketing campaign at a time where they had very little resistance. And what they did was basically uh, market what they were saying was a clean cigarette. And they created a clean narrative to the point where everyone was thinking, this is great, this is not a real cigarette, this is going to help people quit smoking, this is going to be a real good thing. Um, and marketed as a vapor. So there's this vapor misnomer. The, the idea is that when you saw somebody uh, using an electronic cigarette, it looked like they were, they were blowing steam. Um, we know now and, and knew very quickly, actually, in reality, it's, it's not steam. Um, there's, there's no water. It's actually oil that's um, suspended in compressed gas, and uh, an aerosol gas, which Catherine's going to give you a lot of information about. Um, so we have people thinking it's clean, it's just steam, and they aimed it very carefully around young users. So um, they created something that, you know, to, to look at the picture. So this is actually a jewel. Um, you know, it looks very sleek. It looks like uh, almost like a, a big USB cord. Um, it's new and shiny, opposed to what cigarettes were. And what they did was they worked very hard to separate what an e-cigarette was from a real cigarette. And they were really good at it. They added flavors, which again, Catherine will get into a lot of detail around. Um, and there you have sort of this perfect storm. All right, so nicotine in the brain. We need a baseline so everyone kind of has an understanding of, of how nicotine works in the brain and, and how it's so addictive. To understand that, I first need to talk about dopamine. Is everyone familiar or heard the term dopamine? Okay, so dopamine is a neurotransmitter. It's made naturally in brain. Dopamine is involved in anything that people do or experience as pleasurable. So anything from a pleasurable social interaction, a hey, that's a very nice sweater, but dopamine also um, in higher quantities, so when you experience something like winning at gambling, a scratch off, or like a slot machine, uh, it's a sexual activity where there's a, quite a bit of dopamine that's involved in that process. So when you think of dopamine, you think of dopa wow, uh, dopa yay, or dopa woo woo, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, nicotine. Nic uh, when nicotine is inhaled, it's absorbed very efficiently <coughs> through the lungs. So it goes into the lungs, it goes, gets right into your brain bloodstream and goes straight to the brain. In the brain there are receptor cells that are very reactive, very sensitive to the nicotine molecule. Hence they're referred to actually as nicotine receptors. So the nicotine receptors, when a nicotine molecule gets up, hits a nicotine receptor, but what happens by, um, as a result is a release of a number of neurotransmitters, of which dopamine comes in probably the largest quantity. But all those neurotransmitters get fired throughout the brain, so they reach areas of the brain that are responsible for things like memory, uh, appetite, mood regulation, mood regulation um, I'm probably uh, attention and concentration. <laughs> so, uh, nicotine gets absorbed, brain uh, goes into your brain, hits those nicotine receptors, <coughs> boom. Ah. So anyone who ever knows uh, a tobacco smoker or somebody used to smoke and they got irritable um, when they were you know, wanting a cigarette or, or anticipating a cigarette, what was happening is this process creating a, rewards, a reward circuit in the brain. So as nicotine goes in, this process goes, and as you take another puff, it goes again. So dopamine is, is expressed through the brain, and now you've got where your brain is now expecting um, that process and that reward circuit to, to occur. And when your brain and your body like something, they want it to happen again. And this is really the roots and the basis of addiction. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Um, one thing to point out, and again, we'll get into a little more detail later on, when this 
happens in a maturing brain, so an adolescent brain that's not fully developed, that's in the process of maturing and, and, and all of these neural pathways being um, established at that time, for this to happen, there's all sorts of kind of health concerns and risks. So it affects the actual development of the brain, but it also potentially primes the brain to be expecting or looking for an external trigger for that reward, that circuit, that uh, reward circuit that I was talking about. So in essence, it's, it's almost potentially priming the brain uh, for, for the potential for substance abuse, not just nicotine, but other substances. Make sense? All right. Go ahead. So we wanted to talk about what happens uh, in, the, in the process of someone going from being a non-smoker to a smoker. So we created this slide, and, and don't animate it yet, <laughs> uh, to, to try to help people understand, for us to, to try to express or articulate what this is. So if you think about um, a, a non-smoker and a smoker, that there's a distance between those two, a, a person becoming a smoker. And you can think of this distance as either being wider or deeper. So the deeper it can be deep, but you're still pretty close. If it's wider, then the gap is much longer. So there's protective factors and there's risk factors for smoking. Protective factors would be the things that create the gap. So a protective factor, if you consider uh, somebody who um, gets lots of information that um, is negative about smoking, so they know that it causes cancer. They know that it's, uh, it's dangerous, it, 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 it affects lung functioning. If it's something that really resonates with them, like they, they know a smoker, or they've been around a smoker, and they've had like this negative experience with it, it creates a wider gap. So they experience smoking as something very negative, and it's very relatable to them. I have, a, I'm sure he wouldn't mind me saying, but my brother-in-law uh, grew up with my father-in-law, who's a smoker. And he hated, any time he was around smokers, he absolutely hated it. He was so repulsed by smoking. As, and I knew him as a teenager. Any time we were around smokers, he was so negative and so against it. So his gap was really wide. There was no way that anyone was going to bridge. If they had handed him a cigarette or tried to convince him of it, he wasn't going there because it was so wide. So think about that gap as being more deep. So information that goes in, goes in, but it's not really relatable. So the gap sort of stays right here. So go ahead. So now you got a potential bridge. So what helps to bridge that gap are things that promote, put cigarettes in a more positive, we're using cigarettes because everyone's pretty familiar with that, but, but it creates sort of a positive message or a positive role model for somebody to smoke, and then of course you have access. So if you have somebody maybe where this gap is not that far, and say they, um, they have a friend who has, a, who, who has cigarettes on them, and wants them to try, and they're pretty eager, and it's something new, then they give a shot. Mm -hmm. And now you got that person, that risk factor, and you've covered that gap. Um, if you have somebody else, I mean, you can bring them across. So I was going to give you different <laughs> examples, but you all get the idea. Um, and cigarette companies, isn't that cool? That's really cute, right? <laughs> yeah. um, so, but, but we want to point out what's really important with this slide. In terms of prevention, it's, it's really, we have to think about protective factors, how much we can beef those up. But we can't forget about the promotion and the access. If we forget about that, if that information has all gone deep and has not created a relatable gap, a relatable void, then it only takes one cigarette. That reward cycle, and some people can get triggered the first time someone uses a cigarette. In some cases, you know, it takes it takes a little bit of repetition, um, and you know, the brain can get conditioned over time. But this is essentially what we want people to understand and how it works. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right, let's go. This country has a very uh, unhealthy relationship when it when it comes to um, tobacco. You can think of it kind of as a love-hate. You can think of it sort of as a romantic tragedy. Think about it like somebody who married their stalker. Buddy with me? Tobacco goes all the way back to like the 8th, 9th century, uh, Central America, South America, North America. Uh, tribal uh, groups would use it either for medicinal purposes or ritual purposes. It actually came into the United States. Um, around the time that we were beginning to colonize, there's actually, most famously, the Jamestown uh, settlement was, was uh, had used tobacco as, as, as really the, the means to save themselves. 
because tobacco, as it turned out, was something that was very profitable and something that was very desirable to Europe. So from the very beginnings of tobacco, tobacco was an economic choice, it was an economic driver. It's roots to slavery, so tobacco farming was actually very hard to do, as it turned out. Anybody a tobacco farmer here? No? Okay. So as I understand, because I wasn't either, it was very, very difficult. It required a lot of farm hands. The early settlers and even the colonists, early colonists that were around uh, Virginia and the Carolinas, um, they tried the European approach to, to farming, which was to use indentured servants. Uh, they tried to indenture and to essentially enslave Native Americans, and that didn't work out because they were kind of rebellious, and they escaped a lot easier because they kind of like knew where they were and stuff. Um, so the connection then to where the Europeans at that time were starting to bring slaves from Africa, uh, it was pretty common that the colonists would either buy slaves off those ships or trade tobacco for them. And that was the roots of slavery and the connection to tobacco. So not a really good beginning when it comes to tobacco and, and how we had this country, what, what, what's going on in culture in this country. So um, tobacco became much more uh, ingrained. Um, so this is actually, uh, it's not, I don't know if everyone can see it, but that's um, an illustration of a, tobacco, of a cigarette, uh, an early cigarette machine. Uh, so that would take tobacco and wrap it up. That was uh, around, after the Civil War, just around the turn of the, uh, around 1900. And this just depicts where you have the rise all the way up into the 1960s. This is the increasing uh, number of people that were smoking. Um, and you can put in the pictures. Um, important to understand that smoking and the use of tobacco became ingrained in a lot of our culture. So the, the explorer, the, the, the tough guy, um, you know, the Marlboro Man, we were providing cigarettes to soldiers. We were integrating on all levels the use of tobacco and promoting it, which is what caused the rise all the way up into the 60s when the Surgeon General report came out. Am I missing anything on that one? All right. So um, after the Surgeon General report, and some of you might remember this going into the late 70s and 80s, the FBI started to really crack down, um, and they were able to gather a lot of records, and, and they were able to see internal memos. So um, these were all collected afterwards, but it's important for people to understand what was going on in the thinking of the tobacco companies. So and I think, is there a, um, so this quote was from Philip Morris in 1969. The primary motivation for smoking is to obtain the pharmacological effect of nicotine. So even at that point, in years and years before that, they knew what they were doing. They knew that nicotine was addictive and that was actually good. These are business people, they, they wanted to make profit, they wanted to make money. In the past, we at R&D have said that we're not in the cigarette business, we're in the smoke business. It might be more pointed to observe that cigarette, that the cigarette is the vehicle of smoke, smoke is the vehicle of nicotine, and nicotine is the agent of a pleasurable body response. So this is what they knew. This is what they were promoting at that time. So you've got doctors, here's a sports guy, a football player, uh, another doctor. I mean, it's, they, they knew what they were marketing, they knew what it was doing. Um, at that time, uh, well actually this is, back around, this is around the 80s, we wanted to, to show people that there's a history of them actually targeting younger people, including teenagers. So this is a quote actually from Philip Morris, uh, an internal memo from 1981. It's important to know as much as possible about teenage smoking patterns and attitudes. Today's teenager is tomorrow's potential regular customer, and the overwhelming, overwhelmingly majority of smokers first begin to smoke while they're in their teens. It is during these teenage years that the initial brand choice is made. At least a part of the success of Marlboro Red during its most rapid growth period was because it became the brand of choice among teenagers who then stuck with it as they grew older. The rest of this quote actually goes into the fact that their older smokers are dying off and they need to continue to keep, um, re, re, I was gonna say regurgitating, <laughs> um, but in, in, um, in, in infusing more smokers, uh, and again, more customers. This, this is a business model. Your customers are going away, you need to make new customers and you need to constantly keep up with trends. Around the 1980s, as the federal government was cracking down, there was a lot of negative press around, um, around cigarette smoking. Uh, 
the, there were two very important things that, that began to occur within the industry. One, and they'd always been clever. I mean, there's, there's a long documented history of the tobacco industries giving money, uh, particularly in the 1930s and 40s, into the movies. That's why you saw a lot of those characters smoking like they did. Um, but they kind of reinvigorated uh, their efforts in this way. Uh, and there's, um, it, it was, there's actually documented evidence, again, uncovered by the FBI around this time, that they were actually, cigarettes, I think it was Philip Morris that was giving money to movies like Grease, Mr. Mom, uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit. This is a picture of Betty Boop. And you can, if you look really close, which I can, but you guys can't, um, these are uh, camel cigarettes. Um, and to understand that these are all depictions of uh, uh, sexual, uh, sexually uh, viable, attractive people, tough people, uh, people that were wounded or injured in somehow, and they were heroic. Um, I mean, how many guys in here remember, uh, you know, the Riggs from, from Lethal Weapon, or what was his name in uh, Die Hard? Bruce yeah, Bruce Willis in Die Hard. <laughs> uh, yippee ki -yay, right? So this was incredibly influence, influencing to, to the young people at that time, and it was the tobacco companies that weren't saying to smoke, they were showing to smoke. And what's really silly, if you ever watch Lethal Weapon, there's a point where, like, he's smoking throughout the whole movie, but he's got to chase down a car and run, like, five blocks with his shirt off. And, and he's, like, fairly winded, right? So that's, again, that's not saying anything. There's lots of information that smoking was causing lung damage and you couldn't do sports and blah, blah, blah. And here's this guy running down, you know, people. And he was, like, on Oprah. Like, the whole country loved this movie because it was, it was Mel Gibson and Danny Glover as a black and a white cop. It was wonderful. The whole thing, and a lot of money from cigarette companies went into this movie, all right? The other thing that came during the 1980s was they knew they needed a strategy to evolve. So this, again, is another quote. This is um, from the British uh, American Tobacco Company. They were like Paul Mall. Um, and this one, again, internal memo. We're searching explicitly for a socially acceptable addictive product involving a pattern of repeated consumption, a product which is likely to involve repeated handling. Uh, it needs to have nicotine, and the product must be non-ignitable. What does that sound like? Yeah. Right. So this is 1979. So they were reworking their, their marketing at that time, and they were doing that. They were doing their research. They knew they had to evolve. Right. And they did. So this is around the early 2000s. Uh, so the maker of Newport, they were looking at e-cigarettes, including Blue, Marvo with Mark 10, and Camel with Views. Uh, these these early attempts, some were marketing more more marketed more as uh, smoking cessation. Um, it, while that was being marketed, it didn't really look like they really cared whether it was going to be cessation or not. Again, these are business people; they wanted to make money, um, and they weren't very good. You know, they didn't work really well. They were expensive. Uh, they were a little harsher, um, as most people reported or experienced at that time. So along comes a company known as Pax Labs. Pax Labs uh, established in 2007, and they were really about using the electronic cigarette technology and using it to vape marijuana. That was their primary aim. And um, as if you go on the Pax Lab website, uh, they promised a personalized, ex personalized experiences for cannabis. Uh, one of their engineers at that time, again, to kind of bring home the point of this is not about cessation, uh, we don't think a lot about addiction here because we're not trying to design a cessation product at all. He added, anything about health is not our, on our mind. <laughs> so from Pax Labs, around 2017, Juul um, split off. Juul Lab became its own thing because they wanted to pursue uh, a nicotine product that they could use um, through these cigarettes. Okay. And boy, did they do a great job. Fantastic surgical precision. If you were going to model a company uh, and build it, this is what you would do. This is a product, just like all other tobacco products, that that's, um, uh, creates a, a, a need for use just within using it itself. Um, it sells itself. So the Jewel Labs, um, uh, they now have investors that include Fidelity Investments, uh, Tiger Global, and Altria, which is actually the maker of Marlboro. Uh, in 2018, uh, their worth is about $15 billion. 
Uh, they'd only been around um, for a year or so. so. They got a lot of investment and they had a product that they knew that they could sell very quickly. And you'll understand why when, when Catherine explains and, and shows you what they, what they created. Um, and just within, a, uh, within last year, their, um, their revenue was expected to be about $1 billion. Which then, if you think about the wildfire, you think about the money, it makes sense. So now, here we have our, here we go So now we have really great promotion and, and great access. So you can, buy, uh, you can buy a jewel when you're 18 years old. That's legal. Uh, you can buy a jewel online. So if you wanted, if you were a teenager and you wanted to get around your parents, you could get these. So it's, the access is there. The promotion, again, that you'll learn more about, uh, is pretty extensive and pretty effective. Um, and off we are. Are right, you ready? Yep. Any questions for my part? Um, a little bit fast. I know you guys want to get to the panel, right? Do you guys want to hear from the students and not us? <laughs> so you guys are all thinking for questions from the students and not us, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm going to get into a little bit about what vaping is, um, a little bit about the marketing that has come up in that realm, uh, some of the health of effects and some of the concerns that we have. If you guys don't walk away from this night with anything else, I want you all to know that it is not a vapor. Because when we say vapor, it doesn't sound bad, right? So you think about water vapor. We have vaporizers in our house for essential oils and all kinds of things, you know, use humidifiers when you're sick. It's not a vapor. If we stopped calling it a vape and started calling it a salt-based nicotine aerosol, suddenly that sounds like something you don't want in your lungs, right? Because like we could all think about aerosols and how nasty they are. So that's a big thing I want everyone to walk away with. Not a vapor, but a salt-based nicotine aerosol. So vaping is the act of inhaling and exhaling the aerosol that comes right from the vape device. And we'll get into a little bit of the history of these electronic cigarettes and what they've done and what they look like now. Um, the term is used because vapes do not produce tobacco smoke, but they produce that quick cloud. Uh, so again, really good marketing on their part because they decided to start calling it a vapor and it doesn't sound very harmful, but we know better. So again, to remember, it's, it consists of these fine particles that aren't, that aren't just in the liquid. It also creates a new vapor once it gets heated up and now it has heavy metals and other things in that cloud of vapor or aerosol because now we're heating up a plastic and a metal cartridge to turn that liquid into that vapor. So there's a lot of harmful things in that cloud of aerosol that you see. So what are e-cigarettes? These were the originals that Scott kind of talked about before. So it's made up of different components. You have the battery part, you have an atomizer, and it's a coil. And what it does is that's what heats up and then it creates that aerosol. And there's a little aerosol coming out. <laughs> um, this is safe, by the way. <laughs> so it's important to know that it has nicotine in it. A lot of times we heard that it's, oh, it's just a water vapor, it's flavored, it doesn't have nicotine in it. Almost all e-liquids have nicotine in it. And when we get to the pod based systems, which I'll talk about in a minute, every single one of them has nicotine in it. Um, but again, it gets heated up, so it's where all the chemicals come in, and it comes out as an aerosol. And those are some of the samples of the e-juice, which I'll show you a lot more samples later on. So now comes in the pod based systems. And this is really what took the vape industry and just made it skyrocket, because it became more sleek, they had more flavors that we didn't see before, and it became a system where it comes in essentially two pieces, three if you count the charger. But you have this system that gets charged via USB port, and then we have the cartridges. The cartridges are also your mouthpiece, so those just click right in once your device is charged, and that's what you use to activate it. They don't even have an on or off switch on these because you activate it by breathing it. That's how it's done. So the cartridges come with a cover. You take the cover off and you put the cartridge in and that's what becomes the mouthpiece. It's also important to know 
that because kids will share these or pick one up off the ground and use it, not knowing whose mouth was on it before, now we're seeing an increase in things like mono, which is not fun. So it's another unintended consequence of the vaping phenomenon. So again, you have your cartridge, you put it in. The different covers are all color-coded based on the flavor. Um, it's important to know that while Juul came out with flavors like Virginia Tobacco and Menthol, those weren't the popular flavors. The popular flavors were mango and creme brulee, mm -hmm. for a reason. <laughs> and Juul has since vowed to pull their flavors, except for like menthol and tobacco, from gas stations. But we know that they can still get them online. Uh, so I'll be quick on this as you were talking. It's all good. <laughs> and again, all these pods do contain nicotine. And these pods contain a salt-based nicotine, which I'll get into in a minute. So the early products, you kind of saw those in, in where Scott was talking. They kind of looked like cigarettes, and they were designed to be portable. You could throw them out, or you could recharge them. They were a little on the expensive side when they first came out, but we saw prices drop as people started using them. And again, they were really marketed as a cessation pro product. They wanted people to say, hey, this is healthier. We'll get you to stop smoking. Look at us being the good guys. But we knew that they had other tactics. So then it went into e hookahs. So this was the next kind of evolution of the electronic cigarette. So these were all color coded, came in lots of different flavors. It was kind of promoted as a, a hookah device. And you know, there wasn't a lot of nicotine in there because it was really just that flavored liquid. But we knew better. And from then, it evolved into something else where you can start to customize your experience. So these are the vape pens that started to come out and the different tanks. They came in different components that you could swap out and customize. And what you could do is you could pick something that had a better battery life, a stronger charge, a bigger tank. And people actually started creating conventions, especially young people, where you can go, you talk about your devices, how you customized it, you could buy skins for it, you could buy jewels for it, not the jewel jewels, but like bedazzled. <laughs> and suddenly they would have these competitions on vape tricks where you would blow different clouds of, of aerosol and you would do like what we would traditionally see with cigarette, cigarettes where you do like the smoke rings and stuff like that, but now they're doing it with these devices. And the last one before we got into the pod system were these even bigger tanks. And you still kind of see these around sometimes. And you realize how silly people look sucking on something like that? Because it's huge, first of all. And it creates this weird cloud of aerosol. Um, but again, completely customizable. You can buy skins to wrap around them. Um, you can buy them all online. You can buy them, on, buy them on Amazon. And uh, again, you can customize how much uh, of the nicotine liquid you were getting. You can customize the flavor of e-juice that you were using. You can customize the concentration of nicotine in that e-juice and really customize your experience. And then we got into the pod based systems. We, are, we already talked a lot about Juul. I think a lot of people know about Juul. These other ones that started popping up are called Fix, Boulder, and Soren. Now the Soren ones in that corner are brightly colored and look like a highlighter. And they're really easy to hide. The other important thing is they all come with those preloaded cartridges. Now, the whole idea of the cartridge is to throw them out when you're done. But there are also a ton of different ways to teach people how to put their own liquids back in. And that's where you're seeing people put in maybe THC and other things so that now they're vaping marijuana oils instead of just the street nicotine oils. We also know, as I mentioned before, that there's a difference between the liquids that are used in the pod-based systems and the other mod systems. So we're seeing a salt-based nicotine as opposed to the free-based nicotine. And that makes a huge difference because when it's salt-based, it's not as irritating on your mouth, throat, and lungs. It's a smoother hit. So you could do more and more and more of it without it irritating you. So they knew what they were doing. But we're also seeing, you see 59 milligrams of nicotine versus 0 to 36. So it's much stronger, so they had to use that salt-based nicotine because 
They knew how irritating it would be on your body if it wasn't salt-based. The pods, again, are not made to be refilled. Are they refilled sometimes? Absolutely. Is it easy? Absolutely. So just a little note on the strengths of the different pods. We see here a pack of cigarettes is the equivalent of a pack of cigarettes. I'll test you all later <coughs> on that. <laughs> a jewel pod is, is the equivalent of, again, an entire pack of cigarettes. So using about one pod, you get about 200 hits off of that, but it's the same as smoking 20 cigarettes. It's the same amount of nic nicotine on your body. The fixed pods are the equivalent of two packs of cigarettes. And the soaring ones, the ones that look like highlighters, is the equivalent of three packs of cigarettes. And typically we see people go through about one to two pods a day. So if you think about the soaring one, now you're going through about three to six packs of cigarettes a day. That's the amount of nicotine you're bringing into your body. Again, the biggest thing to remember is it's not a vapor, <laughs> it's an aerosol. So you think about a can of hairspray, right? It's an aerosol. You could probably say Afrinet. I know you like that one. I do it's like Afrinet. Kind of kind of kind of <laughs> <laughs> so if you think about like the old can of Aquanet and spraying that, it's a lot different than like a little puff of water vapor, right? And it leaves behind a residue. So we're going to talk about that too because now we're not talking about just secondhand smoke. We're talking about thirdhand smoke as well. She brought the Aquanet thing up among a group of young adults and they didn't know what it was. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't go very well though. <laughs> so again, if you guys don't walk away with anything else, just remember it's a salt-based nicotine aerosol. So I don't know if you guys remember, but the tobacco industry got into some trouble because we had these things called flavored cigarettes. And you know, the government didn't look too highly upon that because they found out that like young people were smoking. So was using flavors that were appealing. Well, the e-cigarette companies were no different, and they went directly into different flavors. And again, we kind of covered that the mango, the fruit medley, and the creme brulee were the big ones. And for anybody here, we do have some samples of jewels and jewel pods and a dab pen over on the table over here if you guys want to get a closer look. It's funny because I had to go into a store and buy it, and I had no idea what I was doing. So we have fruit medley because I go, I don't know the red ones. <laughs> but it's, when we used to do the presentation, we had 7,000 different flavors. In the last two years, that has changed to 15,500 flavors. I can't think of that many flavors, but they've managed to do that. And they have flavors like loaf of sugar, banana butt, honey doo doo, Barney pebbles, dragon's blood. So they're totally appealing to adults, right? Mm -hmm. um, but the interesting thing is, San Francisco tried to ban all flavors for e-liquids. And the tobacco industry got really upset and tried to overturn that. Was anybody surprised that the tobacco industry got really upset and tried to overturn that? No, because they know exactly what they're doing. They're trying to get those young users in so that they can keep growing their business. So this is a little sample of just a few of the chemicals that are found in the aerosol of e cigarettes. It's a long list, right? I'm not even going to go through the long list because I'm not even sure I can pronounce all these things. But the yellow ones, gosh, it's getting crazy. I know, sorry. The yellow ones are the ones that are found uh, back by the FDA in 2012. They're found to be harmful or potentially harmful. So these are all present in that aerosol that people are breathing in. Can I mention one thing? So there were, um, uh, Polson actually uh, sponsored two people from Yale who came and presented to the student body a week ago. One of the things that they pointed out about the flavors is that the more complicated the flavor, uh, the more complex, the more of, of these compounds were found in it. So there's a wide variation of these chemicals, and depending on, on, the, on the complexity and the flavors themselves, uh, they could be more or less full of some of these cancer-causing compounds. So, here's a sample of where other sources where we find these chemicals. Uh, Antifreeze, nail polish remover, paints and pesticides, formaldehyde, or embalming, cigarettes, 
and fireworks. All things that aren't necessarily good for going directly into your lungs. Um, and things that, I don't know if you guys have been to the nail salon lately, but usually they wear a mask because they don't want to breathe that stuff in. And yet here we see people sucking on these e-cigarettes, breathing it directly into their lungs on a regular basis. So some of the health risks, this is the biggest question because people say, well, so what does it do? What does it mean? I keep hearing that it's safer than cigarettes. Well, we can't say that because they haven't been around very long, but we know that there are some side effects. We know that there's a risk of developing things like popcorn lung. And directly, you're impacting and irritating your lung system because again, you're getting that aerosol directly in. We know that there's an impact to your cardiovascular system. And it, it irritates your nose, throat, and eyes. And finally, Scott mentioned it, the risk of addiction to the teen brain. Because the teenage brain isn't fully developed, anytime you introduce a substance in, it makes you more prone to addiction later on. <coughs> and third hand smoke. So I mentioned this a little bit, but what happens is because it's an aerosol, when we think about that residue that's left behind. So that residue falls, and there's still cancer-causing chemicals in that residue that's now on all the surfaces in your house. So you think about, <laughs> now all those particles are sitting there, and what happens is young children and pets are especially at risk for picking up these chemicals. So like, there's another big thing to walk away with. It's an aerosol and save the pets for little kids. <coughs> yeah, that's scary. Um, but it's important to know that we are seeing more and more that people are maybe renting out an apartment or something, they go back in because something's vacated, and they have to redo the entire place because the walls are now dripping with e-cigarette liquids that have been, you know, beeped in the establishment or in the residence. So it's starting to destroy apartments, homes. If you think about the old, like when you would go and look at houses and somebody was smoking inside and everything was like kind of a dingy yellow. Well, now we're starting to see something similar it's all covered with this residue that literally starts to drip down the walls from vaping inside. So again, who's the target audience? We're seeing the same old tricks that we saw before. Um, interesting that Juul pulled like all their advertising after the FDA started looking at them, so you can't even find this ad anymore. And now it's all older people saying how it was great to help them quit smoking. But before they deleted all their Instagram and and uh, social media accounts. We saw tons of images like that. And of course, the other one came out shortly after the Parkland shooting. And there's no, you know, is it a coincidence it, it looks like Emma Gonzalez? Who knows? Mm -hmm. But again, they're using specific marketing tactics that they know will appeal to young people. And we also know they're using social media because again, they have to evolve with the time. So, if there's a crackdown, they find new ways to do it. What they'll do is they'll, set, they'll send devices to like social media influencers. And they'll have them use them on camera and rate the products because they know that they have a huge following from young people. They'll come up with memes that go viral. Um, they'll sponsor different events and put their signage everywhere. They know how to get to where there are groups of young people to use their advertising in creative ways. So what we know. We know that there's evidence that e-cigarette use increases um, the use of using real tobacco or cigarette products. Uh, we know that 30.7% of e-cigarette users started smoking within six months compared to the 8.1% of non-users. So we know that there's a direct link to, from using an e-cigarette or a jewel to going directly into traditional combustible tobacco products. And we know that it can rewire the adolescent brain, which I know we've talked a lot about. We also know that because of the fact that they're still developing, they're vulnerable to the nicotine. And thank you, tobacco industry, because you've definitely showed your internal memos to let us know that you know that. Um, they also have done studies that show a uh, link to tobacco products and an increase of anxiety disorders. So we know that, again, it's impacting our young people in a way that we don't want it to impact our young people. 
And we know that it can also be linked with the use of tobacco, alcohol, and other drugs. Because again, it's rewiring that reward system of the adolescent brain. So there are things that we can do. We can educate ourselves and other parents. So hopefully you guys get some nuggets that you can spread to your friends that weren't here. Uh, we also taped it, so hopefully we'll have that link go out to people too. Um, educate and monitor our young people. Hopefully get them informed so they can make informed decisions. Just like we saw with the tobacco industry. So we know that it's possible. <coughs> we saw a whole generation turn their back on the tobacco industry. And think about Think about going into a bar and having people smoke, or going to a restaurant and being asked if you want the smoking section or the non-smoking section. We have kids now that never had to deal with that question. So there's a chance that we can get back to that like, mentality when it comes to e-cigarettes. We can consider them to be a serious issue. So we can remove them and restrict them. We can get help or guidance from professionals. Uh, we can support the community or state efforts to reduce these reduce youth access and their school policies. I know our school system's done a great job about dealing with this issue uh, at both here at Colson and at hand. We can support legislative initiatives. I know uh, Tobacco 21 has come up in other states, it's come up in Hartford and a few other communities in Connecticut. And we can support law enforcement to enforce the regulations. They do do um, tobacco compliance checks and they will do them specifically focused on vape products. So I've actually seen a lot of actions taken uh, by the schools, and really what one of the first major things I saw was um, the, there's now um, teachers that you know take shifts, and there's uh, like a desk set out um, probably you know just you know, just outside the bathroom because a lot of the uh, times that it was happening, it was happening in groups that would go to the bathroom because they people could escape teachers and go to the bathroom, and um, you know even if one person had. Uh, you know, a jewel or something like that, then they could all share it and uh, just go in groups. But now that there's monitors um, sitting outside the bathrooms, you know, kids can't go in, you know, uh, seven or ten at a time and all have access to one device. And um, another thing that's happening is, uh, you know, we were made aware that there's uh, drug sniffing dogs coming in r at random times. So um, that's helped deter a lot of kids from you know, not wanting to bring stuff into school because the dogs aren't going to miss anything. And because, uh, you know, if a dog catches onto a scent, then it's going gonna, it's gonna to catch whoever's, whoever has it. So. Yeah, and to add on to the dogs, um, this is like a very recent thing. So like they haven't come to our school yet, but there's definitely a lot of talk <clears throat> amongst the students like who are concerned about like the fact that they should like they are deciding to not bring things to school because they know the dogs are going to be there. What about the sale of it at school? I mean, the kids selling to other kids. Um, I mean, I've never seen uh, it be being sold. Uh, I mean, I think mostly that happens outside of school because you know it's a little suspicious if you see you know, one kid handing another kid money in, in the hallway, and it's just you know kind of like what that's you know nothing good is coming out of that. So. Um, I've never I've never seen it happen in the in the hallways or in school or anything, um, because I don't think I think most of the time it's not being sold in school; it's being sold outside of school. And I think um, like to go against the kind of like propaganda that these companies are putting out or used to put out. Um, I think it was Madison Youth and Family Services who did this, but like they put up posters in all the bathrooms, <laughs> and like for example, one of them says. Who knew people would come in here to put crap in their bodies? So, like, it has, like, different, and then it has like other like statistics and stuff on it. So like, I mean, you can't walk away from that and not like at least think something. So it's like something that they're doing to change that. And there's also these things called uh, stall talks, at which a club at the the school writes up like a little report on what's going on and everything. And typically in every stall, they change them like once a month. Um, and it's a piece of paper they put on the doors of the stall, so hard to miss. Um, and they they talk they usually in uh, each of the stall talks they put like side effects and negative um, things that are coming out of these uh, devices. So 
um, you know, people, you're kind of, you're almost like forced to read it, because, um, you know, it's right in front of you, so, um, <laughs> you know, it's, you are, like, kids are, they, they know what's, what's happening. Yeah, and I think, like, the biggest thing is, like, keeping up with the education, like, keeping up with these, like, um, teaching kids about what is actually happening, and I actually didn't know about the aerosol aspect of it, so, like, if we keep, like, making kids aware, and, like, the school's <coughs> definitely doing that, but, like, just keep pushing that stuff, that would definitely make it. And I know the school's been a huge partner for us, not just at hand, but here at Polson. Um, one thing that we did with hand was last year we had um, two high school seniors lead an assembly for the freshman and sophomore classes on vaping. Uh, so they were aware, but it came from their own peers. And it came from, you know, students that they looked up to because they were upperclassmen. Um, they also led us through the school survey. We've done articles uh, with Mr. Salutary, the principal. Here we were just able to send 20 students to a tobacco-free conference uh, so that they can learn all the information they can. And it was great to have 27th and 8th graders at a, high school, at a high school and middle school conference. But I mean, our kids definitely made a presence and they were really well put together. It was great because everyone was bragging about how awesome we were. Um, <laughs> and we also had the assembly. Uh, the 7th and 8th graders had the assembly. And we're working with the 20 students that went to the conference now to try to do something uh, school wide as well. I just can add, you know, obviously our, our code of conduct covers that in their tobacco and products. And, but, you know, someone asked the question about, you know, um, if they can quite talk about not seeing that sale of that book. The ability to buy online is, is, is successful to all, to all the kids. Um, and, 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 you know, the vendors are all there online as well, which makes it very difficult. Uh, to They're also so easily concealed. Like, no one should kid themselves. This is really hard to, to track in terms of monitoring what, what, who has it, when do they have it. Um, it's by design. Like you know, it, the one that, the ones that look like highlighters. So this is a very challenging uh, issue in terms of. Uh, finding you, you would think a kid was doing their homework, right? Slide right. The so there's right. So there it is, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think another issue that you brought up was that um, kids don't know. Like you didn't know about the aerosol aspect. So there was a study that showed that 80% of kids who were using jewels did not know that there was uh, nicotine in it. So it really um, is an educational issue that we're not getting the word out, which is why we're having things like this. Because you know even. Um, adult medicine um, physicians are promoting the use of Juul for their patients to stop smoking, but there is no research that shows that it helps stop, to stop smoking, and it just actually has more nicotine, as you saw, than regular cigarettes. So it's um, just kind of getting this out there. At what age are you finding they're starting to use the Juul? Um, well, I work with the peer helpers at Polson, and um, I know a few of them have mentioned that they know like maybe one or two people who are doing it in seventh and eighth grade. And when are we starting the education as far as the preventative education? I'm hearing middle school and high school, is it worth getting them even at a younger age? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. younger are, are, is, is there a program for, for the, uh, at least starting at a elementary school yeah. level? Not yet. Uh, it's hard to find programs too that are evidence-based for that age group. Because again, it's so new that a lot of the programs that came out that were evidence based were specifically for high school. Um, so it's one of those things we're going to have to work to create I mean, something. Parking back to my high school days, it seems like almost by then the good kids aren't going to necessarily start, but yeah. if you have those bad apples, it, it, uh, I hate to say it's too late. Yeah. Uh, so you've got you to gotta start soon. And that's where the assets are so important, too. The what? The, I'm sorry. The 40 developmental assets are, yeah. these, you know, 40 developmental attributes that are internal and external that we know the more the kids have, the less likely that they are to do things like e-cigarettes and um, even violence, you name it, any risky behavior. How, as a parent, I mean, when we were teenagers and we maybe dabbled with cigarettes and whatnot, it was easy to detect for our parents to know if we had cigarettes. How, is there any telltale signs other than the, I mean, it's expensive, right? So other than the cost, are there any tips or tricks that you have heard of that will help us as parents to detect? No. 
No, it's, it's almost, you know, it, it, so I think if some of the telltale signs, at least at this point, that we're aware of is that there may be a sweet smell in the air. Uh, and, and we kind of heard that in terms of reports at the high school bathroom, you know, that a bunch of kids would go in and they'd leave it, it would be smelling better. <laughs> <laughs> but, but other than that, it, it's, you know, again, it's by design. Uh, and that know, smell, do you know if it's marijuana versus nicotine or? I don't know if you could tell. You probably, I mean, it's, if it's, it's, it's quickly. Um, look for the residue because there will be residue on some stuff will feel oily. Uh, and they're surprisingly not that expensive. Um, so a four pack of cartridges is $15. The initial purchase of a jewel right. is about 60 bucks. But then after that, the cartridges are cheap. Um, I guess another thing would be, uh, yeah. like there's like a little cap, like a colored cap that goes on the pod before you use it and you, you know, you take it, like people take it off and then they put it in. So I guess if you see like little caps, like colored things that you don't know what it is, but it looks like, yeah, yeah, that, yeah. Um, cause you know, like I think once they take it off then they don't use it again. And you know, if that's dropped and yeah, if it's just around, like I'll walk into a bathroom and there will be one in the, uh, in the stall. I mean, not in the stall, in the urinal. And it's like, come on, like these things are all over the, like, and it's just like, what? They look like that. And we're gonna pass, they're, they're, this is them, we're gonna pass this around. That's the uh, so people, that's, can, the, that's, that's the, the card. card. That's a, so this is the jewel, and if you remember from the animation, this is the cartridge and it goes in like that, and then you suck on this end. But there's a cap to that. Yeah, there's cartridge. a little cap. Yeah. To yeah. That you'll see on the when we pass it around, there's like a little red cap. It's, yeah. it's fruit red leaf, so it's red. Um, so that part comes off and it gets started. The funny thing is, do you remember how upset people were that there were cigarette butts all over the ground? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, now we're finding jewel cartridges all over the ground. So pay attention to that when you go to different stores and you parking lots. Look down and see the crushed little cartridges. Mm -hmm. We're going to pass around the jewel as well. So if I can ask a question to the students. First of all, thank you for being here and educating all of us. But I know we have statistics from the towns, from the surveys. Uh, but how many kids would you say, if you were to just guess, like what's the percentage of kids that actually use e-cigarettes in the high school, would you say? Um, it, I think it's definitely, like, depends on the grade, um, because obviously, like, I know our grade, especially based on those tests, t this is the seniors, um, like, they, we took the test when we were juniors yeah and that was the first time that the juniors had ever had higher rates than the seniors at the school so like I guess our grade tends to be on like like more users than like average for juniors and seniors so what would you say for I mean well so we took like a little survey um, last year and it's like in the last 30 days have you done this done this done this done this and um, they're anonymous so people probably are more honest than they would be if it wasn't um, and I mean, if I was to take a guess, probably 35, 40 percent. Yeah, I think it was probably higher than what the yeah. survey says. Yeah. yeah. And do you think that any of this educational materials, do you think it's bringing the numbers down at all yet? I mean, um, I would hope so. Yeah. Um, because it's, it's scary <laughs> it's, looking yeah. at. Yeah. And it's fairly immediate. Like it's like recent um, kind of actions that are being taken. So it's like kind of hard to tell at this point. But I. Like in my French class today, we were actually talk. We had a discussion about this, like in French, and some people were talking about like their friends who were like deciding to quit, or something like that. Like <coughs> people did that. So, is there support for kids to quit? You know, they admit that you're, you know, stuck on these. We're going to help you. Is there That's a good question. I mean, <coughs> not really. Um, you know, I mean, I definitely talk to every single teenager I see about smoking, vaping, drinking alcohol, yeah. you know, using drugs. But in terms of like um, a quitting program for kids, not really. I mean, there's a quit line that also has vaping um, as um, a topic that you can um, use. Um, but like Nicorette gum isn't approved for kids. Is it as difficult to quit as cigarettes? Because the nicotine is, is um, a higher level of nicotine, so a higher level of addiction. Yep. 
it's also, I think it's also hard to like, you know, get a kid in a class, like, to help him quit because I think someone would never, they, like, a, a teenager will never admit that, that they're doing this because, you know, they, it's, the legal age is 18, they're, they're, it's against the law, so they're never going to be like, oh, yeah, I'm doing this, like, let's, let me go through a program to, to get, it, to help me quit. But I do think that I have heard, overheard people saying, like, oh, this is starting to hurt my lungs, like, they, they're already, like, they can physically feel the aspects of it, and they're like, maybe I should quit. And I, yeah, you should. <laughs> <laughs> but, but if I can just point out a couple of quick things. One, so the, actually, there is some good news in this, in that and these are nicotine products. So some of the, the treatment options and, and the things that you would do for people to, to quit smoking, you would use for Juul. So, so I also work as a therapist, and I've had young people come to me, and, and I'll give them some of the same kind of tips that I would give to somebody who was quitting smoking. So that's important to know. And the thing around, um, you know, the, 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 what was it, the, the glycol, I'm trying to think of, they're oils. So, so these, yes, so these are, these are oils suspended in the gas. Um, and we don't really know how, how lungs are really prepared. Well, obviously, they're not designed to, to deal with, with oils. Um, so we're not sure how that's going to play out, but that's another, that's another piece that people are concerned. So people are using it to, to quit smoking. Um, it's kind of like, if they're understanding this as a cleaner cigarette or a better version of a cigarette, you know, depending on what you then vape and the, the chemicals in that, that <coughs> So you could actually be kind of trading from swimming with five sharks to swimming with four sharks. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's really we, it, it's like that. Um, let me. I'm going to try to facilitate. So we can get to many questions. I think you had your hand up, and then this gentleman who's who's been racing his hand every five seconds. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, along the lines of you know, as a parent, what can we do to find it, know what it is, smell it, all that? When you find the doctored cartridges, what are we looking for? <coughs> When you find the cartridges? The doctor the cartridges. It's, it's, it's very at, easy to switch out. Exactly so am I looking for another smell? Am I looking for the traditional smell? Am I looking for, if I find a cartridge or a cap, does it have a puncture in it that they've refilled? <coughs> like, what's the deal? So to refill the cartridges, what you do is you kind of take the top off the cartridge and you either empty it out or it's already empty and you leave it. And then you almost take like a syringe and you refill it with THC oil. Then you put the cap back on, so it's going to look exactly the same. Um, there are THC test kits that you can get. Um, some that the high school uses now too, uh, that you swab and it'll come up positive for THC. So you know that there's that's present in the pump. So the kid doesn't have to pee in a cup to to get the results. No, not for uh, testing the actual liquid. So what it does is you swab it and then you rub the swab on this little sample slip and it'll come up pink or red. Depending on if THC is present, the kits are purchased. You get four of them for ten dollars. It's relatively inexpensive. And the high school just recently got a bunch of these, so they can now, if they get, if they confiscate um, a vaping pen or an e-cigarette, they can swab it and know, uh, which is another piece of information I think that's now getting out to students in addition to the dogs. Um, again, like the idea of enforcement and monitoring um, is becoming. <coughs> You mentioned there was a possibility of an anxiety disorder. Can you uh, elaborate on that? And there was, uh, yeah, so there's, uh, what they found is there's a link to nicotine use and anxiety, especially around uh, quitting and stuff like that. Um, so it's all in the way that it kind of rewires the, the teen brain, and it makes you more susceptible to anxiety and depression, um, especially as you're sitting there going through the cravings, too. It also makes it really hard to focus during the school day because now you're thinking about getting, you know, your next fix or anything else. I mean, um, and it, just along like side effects, like I've heard of people who like they, you like you you, you would think that you would not want like people would not want to do it before a test, but now they need to do it before a test so they can focus. So like whereas before, you know, they would they wouldn't be able to focus because they just used um, like a jewel, but now they need to use a jewel so that they can like. Uh, not have a headache. And people like going through the SAT and like having to use it during the break that they give you during like the four hour test. And I think like, not that you can just say like, oh, if your kid's irritable, then they're like using a jewel, but like that is one of the signs for people like they tend to even say like, oh, I'm like, I'm feeling irritable or something like that. Like that could be one of the signs. 
Or that they're a teenager and they're irritable. Yeah. So it's going to be like say. Um, but to, you know, to, I think, again, it's another example where, you know, as a parent, your, your first responsibility is to open up the conversation and to ask. You know, we wanted to make sure that it was a very clear point that, in the end, the things that what you can do is to understand that this is, it's not steam, it's not, it's not safe. So when, if you find the cartridge or you have an idea, it's something to take very seriously. Um, aren't the uh, cigarette companies already kind of getting prepared for the possible legalization of marijuana to make these ready? Yes. And isn't there something we can be So, um, the... <laughs> Philip Morris, who just purchased a huge stake in Juul, uh, they, they have a 35% share of Juul now. Um, but they just came out with this huge press release saying that, uh, look how great we're being, we're going to stop, we're going to slow down on manufacturing cigarettes. Mm -hmm. But the reason that they're slowing down on manufacturing cigarettes is because they just purchased 35% of Juul and they positioned themselves to be a huge player in the marijuana industry. So we're going to see kind of those same tactics of advertising to our young people with not only Juul and e-cigarettes, but marijuana as well. Yeah. I, I had a mom actually who brought in um, four cartridges that were in a case that her son admitted to her he got from a drug dealer that had little marijuana stickers on them. So, I mean, he, they were cartridges <coughs> of marijuana. I'm going to take, I'm going to get you, because you're, but before you do, so uh, as the director of Youth and Family Services, um, I, just so you know, we're very much opposed to any kind of legislation that legalizes marijuana in the state because of, of these particular issues. Uh, the concern being that any marijuana companies or the marijuana industry getting a foothold and doing some of the same kind of marketing tactics that we know are very have been used very successfully. If you're concerned about youth issues, if you're if you know how hard it is to do prevention work uh, with with kids and keeping kids away from from tobacco, e-cigarettes, marijuana, alcohol, uh, this would, would pretend to be a, a, a making that issue a lot harder. So um, it's just, you know, it's something that we're being as clear as we can in terms of a position on, on that particular issue. Um, and we'll go to you and then we're going to get back around the room. So I'm glad to hear that uh, you're against the legalization of it because I feel like we're sending mixed messages to our kids by the trend being towards legalization of marijuana in a lot of states around the country. I think it's up to about 30 now, maybe, did I hear? I uh, know. I don't think it's 30 states, but no, it's... it's, 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 yeah. it's I mean, it's, 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 it's being discussed yeah, at the state the level in the legislature. And they're doing it for tax purposes. I mean, because they're all in, you know, dire straits. They need money. But that's the wrong reason to legalize it. And I think that, you know, with texting and driving and... Who's doing the texting and driving? Generally, the younger people that have the least amount of experience behind the wheel, and they can't even handle driving properly, let alone being distracted by being on the phone and texting, and now they're going to be under the influence? I mean, where is this going? It's not going in the right direction. Ironically, aside from the youth health aspects of legalization, we know from Colorado that uh, for every dollar they bring in in tax revenue, they spend four in the unintended consequences. Wow. Well, so they should really. We already um, have a deficit. <laughs> they should promote that information because that would help turn so the trend. All right, in the high schools, how how popular is the vaping of THC or marijuana? Is that like as a percentage or kids? Is that just a kind of a small subset of people that are, have jewels, or is that a big part of it? Um, well, I think for the jewels, like that's basically the main um, thing that people use. But I'm not entirely sure about the. For nicotine th or marijuana. I think that for nic I think that the jewels are used more for nicotine because you know they don't kids don't want to bother going through the process of refilling them. But then there's these things called dab pens, which is like a like a really high concentration of THD. Um, so it's like it's not just like smoking weed, but it's like extremely concentrated so that even one like I think one hit of it will get you will get like a kid. So that's high. used for that's marijuana. Yeah. This can be used, yeah. So this is much I, I, my understanding is that jewels are not as as as, um, as popular when it comes to, to filling them with the THC oil. So that's these nicotine are a little bit, and that's yeah. marijuana. Well, I mean, this you could use a nicotine right. product for this, but yes, you could use okay. it also. That's specifically a dab pen. Yes. So you would put the wax. It's almost like a, it almost looks like an earwax to me. 
gross, <laughs> um, in the pen. And what they use is they use butane to extract the pure THC. It comes out as a wax. It's, if you think about back in the 70s, a joint was about 4% THC. Well, the wax that people will bake through those devices is 80 to 90% pure THC. Yeah. And there's no smell that you could associate with it necessarily. It dissipates so quickly. You might get the traditional smell that you would associate with marijuana, but then because it's that aerosol, mm -hmm. it disappears into the air and stealthier. You had mentioned that um, there was an increase um, rate in mono. Has there been any increase in meningitis, things like that, because they're going mouth to mouth? For Not that I've ever heard of. We're having a hard time keeping up with this, honestly. So, I mean, the information that we would have given you a year ago is very different than we have today. That would be very different than we have in a year. So, uh, you know, the American Academy of Pediatrics, I just went to that conference um, a couple months ago, and there's about 20 talks at any one moment. So you choose what you want to go to, except for the middle of the day. In the middle of the day, there is one talk for everyone to go to, and it was on Julie, because this is like front and center, like we realize right now what is happening to our teens, and we didn't realize a year ago. And, you know, like we said, we were like winning the battle against the tobacco companies, and we had somehow convinced our kids that smoking was gross, and that it was us against the tobacco company, and now we're totally losing this. And so we have to like get on this. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think parents have to know about it, kids have to know about it, professionals need to know about it, and we just need to have those conversations. And I'd love to hear that there's those posters. I live yeah. in Guilford. I don't know if Guilford has those posters. Now I'm going to find out if we have those <laughs> posters yeah, in Guilford. Hold on, there's, there's a person over here. Thank you. I just wanted to ask a question um, regarding when someone stopped smoking e-cigarettes. E like, it was publicized, you know, in the last few years that if you were to give up smoking, you know, after this amount of months, your lungs are like this much healed, and if this, you know, a couple of years, until you get to the point where you're a non-smoker, you know, your lungs could resemble a non-smoker. Yet there's this phenomenon now that people are talking about, and, they, and it was mentioned earlier, the whole idea of popcorn lungs and how that that isn't treatable or healable. Is that? Can you explain a little bit more what, what is that, that is? Yeah. Can you explain <laughs> what that is? Yeah. So. Um, it's a condition that people who actually used to work in like popcorn, like microwaveable popcorn factories, um, would develop in their lungs because lungs aren't made to take in certain chemicals. Um, so it causes damage to the inside. We don't know at this point if certain aspects of that are reversible after a period of time of not vaping uh, because we, it's still so new. I mean, even on these handouts that we have for you guys now, it says, you know, we don't know what's going to happen to these kids in 10, 20, 30 years. We know that there's carcinogens in this, mm -hmm. and we know that there is nicotine and it's addictive. What we also do know is that there is a higher rate, which has kind of was mentioned, of substance abuse subsequent <coughs> to using them. Is it because you're stimulating these receptors? Is it because kids that are more likely to jewel early are more likely to do drugs? Anyway, we don't know that. But we do know that if you know that your child is jeweling, then they have a higher risk going forward of using um, all different substances. How often do you do the surveys? Is it once a year? It's once every two years. Okay. The next one will be in the fall of 2018. Yep. Like in the fall of, of whatever's coming. <laughs> Where we are now, which one? It's all for years of high school. It's all for years of high school. It's just uh, I think I saw a hand over here. But uh, I was just saying that uh, no, when I was a kid and it was all about cigarettes and, and dope, it, the, it wasn't, you were doing it to be cool. It was part of being, hey, I'm doing this because my friends are doing it. And, and if you were with the right kids that weren't, it wasn't cool to do, you, you weren't influenced as much. And it's the same, I'm sure, no, nobody's going to, no kid of ours is going to do it because they want to get addicted. They're going to do it because it's a cool thing to do. So. I think the more we collectively can do as parents and as, as, as school administrators to educate and as peers, peers to peer that this is not cool. You're, you're hurting yourself just like with cigarettes. There's, it's not smelly and gross, but it's damaging your body and it's just not a cool thing to do. That will dissuade more kids from 
trying it and that, getting hooked. That, that's the idea. One of the things that vaping was very successful at was, was crossing, uh, they were able to cross different, um, different subgroups of, of kids. So like where smoking maybe might have been associated with a tougher gang or a cooler gang, mm -hmm. vaping really was something that attracted across all sort of strata of teenagers. Um, and since it was clean and it didn't smell, it, it, it didn't, people did not associate some of the more negative aspects to it. Go and on. I think just to like put emphasis on this, I think one of the major things to take away from this is that like the discussion between parents and their kids needs to be like definitely opened up and I know the school like sent out an email and like we had a PAW meeting which is kind of like a homeroom um, and I think like that's one of the biggest things to take away is to like have these discussions with your kids. There was a hand over here somewhere. The, and then um, the narcotic dogs, they're trained to not just suit narcotics but other things such as these. Yeah, I, I believe that they can. That's my so they're, yeah. Okay, so the dogs, so my um, child told me that the dogs were coming in from school and we had a big discussion about that one evening. And he said that, you know, people were talking about it and people, you know, oh, in high school, there was a lot of talk about it. Mm -hmm. And um, my question is, 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 is it a scare tactic or is it really going to happen? Because I think that, you know, there's a lot of problems in high school. It's not just um, these pods and dueling, yeah. um, the problems are much bigger that the kids um, are very aware of. I think, I have no doubt that's going to happen. Uh, and I mean, it needs to happen like, yeah. all the time, like not just one time, but I mean, it has to be... And there's a plan right? for it rolling it out, too. So yes, it's not just going to be, gonna be mm -hmm. boom, here are the dogs coming in as a SWAT thing. Um, there's going to be education in the health classes about what yeah. the dogs do and how it looks. And there's a whole plan that um, I know went out from the superintendent uh, as to how they're going to unroll. And will we be, I mean, I'm glad that my child communicated told me about that, but are we going to be... I think the superintendent put out, Frank, uh, yeah, the superintendent yeah. put out a notice about this. Yeah, he did. And, and, and no. I think... Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Board chair on that. <laughs> there is a there is a plan um, going forward, and it's starting at the high school. Um, the superintendent first started with parents. There was an article in the paper that now it's going into the health classes, um, and then the dog will be familiarized within the school, so kids will recognize the dog, um, and then there will be um, not surprise visits, but unannounced yeah. um, visits by the dog. Um, so it, there is a very um, and that. I'm not sure if it's online anymore, but it, um, certainly if you email the superintendent, he can get you the schedule of, of the actual plan that um, was put together. And put not just the year that's going to happen. On a consistent, this is a job that's employed by the Madison Police Department, so it's a part of our community. So it will be in another. And that they're being so proactive to inform parents and inform and get the students more on that's the prevention part. So when this topic had come up in years past, because this is this has been something the school I think has considered for a, for a little while now. Uh, it really acts as prevention if you're forward and you tell people that this is what you're doing and you get the students involved. The, the, the third part obviously is when you don't know that they're going to come back, but you're aware that it's possible. Yeah. And, uh, I'm a I'm a class officer for the senior class, and we had a we recently had a, a meeting with Mr. Salutary, and um, he told us that it, like it is going to happen, and it's like a, it's a real uh, thing that is coming to hand. But like they also want to warn all the students and the student body, so they're not they're not just bringing dogs in because they don't want to have to suspend. Yeah, they don't want to have to suspend numbers of kids, and uh, they don't want to catch all these things. But they want to give um, an opportunity for people to to change. And to you know to avoid uh, doing all this stuff, so yeah, mm -hmm. get the stuff out. You know, get it out of the high school. Yeah. Is there a plan to bring the dog to as well? Not at this time. No, and you have to, and you need to know a little bit more about the dogs. One dog isn't going to make much of an impact at a school. If you hear, uh, is it Mulder? You know, they would bring. They have to get them from multiple dogs from around the state to have any impact. One dog. And the energy that the dog uses for any one, you know, period of time would have no impact. Um, it's a multiple dog process. Right. So, but no, we haven't had any conversation about having that. Right here on your mic.
can this dog detect the um, the THC in those devices too? Um, you had said that there isn't really a program for addressing the situation in below um, Fulton in a Brown school with all the sixth graders coming to Fulton next year. Are they even, are they talking about it in health class? Like, is it something that when they talk about, I know they talk about cigarettes and marijuana. I mean, is this all in the conversation currently in fifth grade? It is, yeah. In sixth grade. It is part of the health curriculum. It's part of the health curriculum. We will continue to sixth graders come here. Like the program we have, the research is even out. We're going to do that. We certainly will make that part of the sixth grade program as well. One question. I, you can't tell parents how to say how to raise their children. However, we can. We do speak. all the time. <laughs> 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 it really seems no, like more. a lot of parents seem to be getting more and more comfortable with just, you know, a bunch of kids are over for the evening, so they can all just hang out and do their thing, and I'm not going to interrupt them and invade their privacy or their devices and things like that. Is there any notion of educational programs towards parents? There we are. Certainly, that there are parents that are a little less attentive, and, and maybe out of busyness or, or other factors. Um, you know, I, I, I can't say that I've, I've met. Uh, I've met a lot of parents in, in my role uh, <coughs> in the youth services. Most parents are worried about their kids and paying attention. And oftentimes, when I interact with a parent who's concerned about somebody else, and I tell them. You know, here's a mechanism to get information to that parent. They, they take advantage of it and they communicate. We're actually very lucky. This is a pretty healthy community. Uh, by and large, we're, we're a group of pretty healthy adults. Um, you know, it's, we ain't perfect, but <laughs> uh, I hope that helps. Uh, any other? We'll, we'll do like maybe one and then maybe one more question after that and get everyone home. Just one more logistical question. In terms of secondhand smoke, how long does it actually stay in the air? You know, that's a good question. The aerosol? The aerosol fades pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and it depends on what device. If we're talking jewels, it fades really quickly. If we're talking some of those modified devices, it lingers a little bit longer. Um, so the second hand effects are still kind of to be determined. Um, but there's a huge concern about those third hand effects of um, all the residue collected on everything. All right, who wants the last question? Mm -hmm. That's just a the on the table. I don't think we need those people. Yeah. And I'll move the sign-up list for the video up to the desk up there so it's a little bit easier. And there are a lot of parent handouts here. And we can put those back there too if you want. Thank you so much.